complicated. Britain is a trading nation and has been for centuries. Businesses, large and small, sell goods and services all over the world. But absent rules, absent the knowledge of what is going on on the ground, seizing those opportunities becomes much more difficult. The WTO is about transparency. You know the law of the land when you try to engage in business in foreign markets. You don't know that without these kinds of rules. Britain is a founding member of the WTO, which means that since 1995, Britain has been trading on WTO terms. This simply means the rules of the game outside of the European Union and those countries with which the EU has trade agreements. So for many of Britain's trading The Doha Development Round was set up to deal with the many deficiencies that existed in the World Trade Organization's existing agreements. So the idea was to ensure that they were reviewed. And um, you look at um, different arrangements around agriculture where it was decided that the US and the EU would come with a package on how to deal with their subsidies with a view to lowering those subsidies over a period of time. This was very important. As well as to look at market access issues for products from the Global South to enter the markets of the EU and the US. Now, <laughs> instead of this happening and this really being a development round, it has become a super development round in favor of the industrialized countries, which rather than dealing with the deficiencies in the system, have added more issues onto the table, such as competition policy, government procurement, investment, very complex arrangements. In, in, in a sort of horse trading idea that, well, if you give us concessions on these very complex issues which many developing and least developed country are, are, are not ready for, in, in they, can, they cannot even manage what is on the table now, let alone bringing on even more complex arrangements onto the table. And in turn, the EU and the US would then consider um, how to get rid of their domestic subsidies. Subsidies are extremely political. You look at a country like France. If you get rid of agricultural um, subsidies, that's death for whoever the candidate is. You're not going to get elected. And um, in, the, in, the, in the UK, not as much. In the US, the agricultural basin of that country, if you do not um, give concessions, uh, concessionary um, subsidies to farmers there, you will not be elected in those particular states. So they've taken on, you know, um, a more domestic nature in the sense that if you're going to attack subsidies, you have to attack the political situation in your home and um, probably suffer the consequences of your political party losing an election over subsidies. So this is really how deep they are. But I say this to show just how entrenched these subsidies are in local society in the industrial north and how difficult it is going to be to get rid of these subsidies even when they distort trade and undermine the processes of the global south and give and, and the opportunities that they could possibly have to even you know produce in their own countries I don't use the mic.
I just, you know, use the inbuilt speaker. But the, here is different. Okay, sorry. Uh, just now, uh, the virtual people, I'm sorry. I mean, the virtual group people, I'm sorry. <laughs> virtual people. I'm um, sorry, the, the mic was out just now, so I had no choice but to um, play the video. Okay? Anyway, I, well, now I need to find the slide again. Okay, here. All right. Uh, I have actually one more video that I want to watch, but uh, I, you know, I will. I, I think I better discuss the stuff first because video y'all can always watch on your own. And also, the, you know, every time I watch the video, you know, with that 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 particular video, right? I always tell myself I should learn how to speak more calmly, but it, it never ever sticks with me. Anyway, uh, what she mentioned in that video, if you didn't catch it, right? That one, uh, this one, the what is the WTO's DDA? This particular video. Please go back and watch it again. Watch particularly the argument that she makes on the importance of uh, subsidies, number one. Number two, the relevance of subsidies uh, and how uh, particularly it is, you know, it is a domestic issue, right? You know, specifically she mentioned, right? It's a domestic issue uh, and countries uh, who are negotiating with each other, right? Why is it that they want, okay, logic, very simple logic. Why do they want developed countries to reduce the amount and the intensity of the subsidies that are given to their agricultural industries. What, 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 is, what is the motivation of giving subsidies in the first place? Say, for example, for a farming industry, right? Why do they give subsidies? Why are subsidies given to farmers? To do what? What does that do? Hello. Why do they give subsidies to farmers? Huh? No, the, the real, the, let's put the election advantage one side first, right? What is the, what is the real function of subsidies? Huh? For who? For the farmers to produce. If cost is reduced, what? Yeah, give them a, okay, correct. Yipen, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Correct. Reduce cost means what? If I, if I can produce more cheaply, if I as a farmer can produce more cheaply, then I can? Sell at a better price, right? Because my profit margin is higher, right? So that means I can, I, I can basically be more, more. Yeah, actually, I already said the word already, right? <laughs> I can be more competitive, right? Like what Yipeng also mentioned, give them a chance to compete, right? So if you're looking at, uh, you know, if you're looking at trying to reduce the inequalities and the discrepancy between producing in a developed country versus a developing country, if the same types of subsidies Right, are not made available to the farmers in the developing countries, are they going to be able to produce as cheaply as the developed countries' farmers? No, right? So can they compete effectively? Cannot because they would because they produce at a if they are producing at a higher price, basic economics, uh, right? If they're producing at a higher price, then they would have to sell also at a higher price, right? If they sell at a higher price, if you're looking at the global trading system, as a consumer, which product would you pay for? Or which product would you, would, you, you, would you buy? The more the cheaper one, right? And of course, if, if it's a cheaper product that is being produced by a developed state, there is also an association of the logic of, you know, like uh, better technology, better water, uh, the nutrients may be higher, the quality gin in general, may, you know, it may be perceived as, as being higher also. Correct? Logic. Right? So it's a simple logic, right? So that is why subsidies are integral to the industries to start off with, right? And if you look at particular states, for some states, right, if you recall, agricultural basis and the agricultural industry is critical. It's very, very large. That means it's a main contributor to GDP, Right? If it's a main contributor to GDP and it's a very, very large industry, then it becomes, it, or it can become, politicized. Why does it become politicized? Because that is where your voter base comes from. Now you go to what Gabriel mentioned just now, right? When you said, you know, what did you say? Uh, you said something about, what did you say? The elections thing. Uh, the uh, electoral advantage, right? So if you are at the Doha, uh, if you are at the negotiating round at the WTO, right, and you basically say, okay, I agree to cut level of subsidies, right, for my domestic industry, what does it look like? You are alienating your voter base back home, right, because voter, uh, sorry, uh, elect agricultural subsidies become an electoral issue, 
that was basically what you know she was discussing in that um, in that video, and this was actually critical in India's negotiations, right? Because in that period, right, particularly when uh, during the Doha negotiation rounds uh, in 2013-2014, if I'm not wrong, that was a very critical election year in India because you had uh, Modi, right, who had just come on board and, and there was a shift from Congress to BJP, if I, yeah, if I remember correctly, right? And that was a very important election year. And farming and agricultural subsidies, uh, agricultural policies has remained a very, very large electoral issue in India in particular. So what you do is you take, you see, what, what did I do? I took, I went back to the original concept of what subsidies are, how subsidies are relevant uh, to the particular industry. How does that then, then I made the connection from there, how does that then relate to uh, developed versus developing countries and the trading imbalance that it can create as a result of you know, buying and selling, right? And then I linked it back to the example. So when I, if I have this thought process in my head, right, I can condense it or summarize it in my exam answer, right? Or I would be able to explain the problems relating to the negotiations much more easily. You understand the logic now here? Right, so you got to get this this thing right. So you know, if, if you are reading, then suddenly out of nowhere, why is it that the US is having problems with the the, the logic of subsidies? Doesn't want to agree. Why is India negotiating in that way? Right, the argument doesn't become clear to you. The argument should be so clear to you, right, in your in terms of your understanding that you should be able to summarize it according to what you need for the exam answer. Do you understand? So it's no point, that, that is why I say, you know, it is no point just reading off the notes or reading off, you know, in Khan's Mings and Styles and so on because you cannot replicate that exact whole argument. The logic is for you to understand, right? And then, however, however you need to use it in your exam answer, you can summarize effectively without having meaning loss in translation. Do you understand? Right? So that's why, you know, logic is that no point giving, you know, looking at model answers. No point looking at, you know, uh, memorizing chunks and chunks of material. Understanding is actually key, right? So when you make your notes, please do this because I see people making notes. Very nice, very neat notes, right? But the notes are basically a replication of the, le of the lecture of notes, right? And I ask students, you understand what you are writing down there? Crickets, right? Because basically what they've done is they've replicated the material from the subject card or the lecture notes. You need to understand the rationale behind it, right? And, uh, you know, even, you see, logic is this. I asked you a very simple question about, you know, the logic, the, the economics logic, right? Even if you don't have economics background, and this can, can understand, right? It's very simple. So logic is also this. Please do not shy away from topics like this and IMF and World Bank, right? And get in WTO. If you think that you're not a maths person, uh, I'm the most non-maths person you can come across probably on campus, right? So, you know, uh, you know if you're not a maths person, if you're not an econs person, right? The, actually, the concepts behind it are very simple. Don't just brush it off because these sometimes questions, you know, relating to this topic, right, very standard. And, and they're so standard, right, that you already know when you look at the question, you know what you need to include. Right? IMF, World Bank, you know, you get a question on structure adjustment program, right? So easy to answer, right? So don't, don't I, know, I know people will start cutting away topics coming to prelim exam, right? Don't arbitrarily cut away a topic thinking that, oh, I'm not strong in economics, I'm not strong in maths, right? And then you don't want to do the topic because you may you may find that the most straightforward, simpler questions may actually come from these kinds of topics, right? Or you could ask, or you could get a question on what is the contribution, right, of international organizations to lowering inequalities between the global north and the global south? Such a beautiful, simple, straightforward question that you can very easily answer with knowledge from different, different topics. You understand? Okay. All right. Okay. So when you look at the Doha, is it me or is it like very, very stuffy in here? Very stuffy, right? Huh? It's very stuffy, right? It's colder outside than it is here, yeah, right? I'm very uncomfortable. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very thin top somewhere. I'm very uncomfortable. I should have called the, the office just now, the, the estate just now. Okay, never mind. When I'm watching a video later, I, I, if I have time, I will call the estate. Okay. Um, okay. When you look at the Doha developing round, right? Uh, so basically, the logic uh, is to boost the economies of the developing states. So in, in this Doha round, right, the 
the voice of the developing states becomes very strong. So make sure that you know when you write, when you write that down in your notes, right? That you have to emphasize on the developing states, right? And the negotiations uh, that you know they wanted to, uh, you know, conclude, right? Uh, and this was one of the longest rounds uh, that you you have seen, right? It covers about twenty areas of trade, right? And they were you know basically you know putting practically everything uh, on on you know on the agenda, right? So you know you've got tariffs and 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 taxes that you know uh, being negotiated to reduce, right? From every Thing, from wheat to cars to even you know uh, you know uh, clothing right okay uh, and they wanted to look at the restriction of use of subsidies for farmers and fishermen why because the you're 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 looking at not making uh, production overly cheap right if production is overly cheap then it reduces the comp the the ability to price it competitively right okay so that was the logic that that's why I wanted to explain that logic earlier on okay. All right. Uh, and then you also want to start, you know, to bring on, and that's where the complications arose, where you have, sorry, where you have, right, the developed countries now wanting to start to include all of these other uh, issues that your developed, sorry, your developed countries want to include all of these other, you know, more high level economic uh, uh, issues, right, like investment, government procurement, um, e-commerce, right, which was actually not really the main focus or the main interest, right, of the developing states. The developing states were still interested in, uh, you know, the goods in agricultural uh, sector in particular, right, okay? So that's where you get the IPR, the intellectual property, right, and the copyrights, you know, on, on all of these issues. And that was not exactly, you know, what they were actually quite interested in. Right. So what happened was, you know, at the inception of the Doha round, like what you saw in the video just now, right? You have this huge discrepancy uh, that is arising, you know, from what the wants of the U.S. and the European, you know, uh, negotiators were in comparison to the, um, in comparison to the developing states, right? And your, you know, your the main problem really is that, you know, your developing countries like China and India. So remember what I mentioned earlier on. Right, these are labels, generic labels that are slapped on these countries, which are actually experiencing huge growth spurts, right, and and starting to you know um, become economic powerhouses that are rivaling right a lot of those states in the developed category, right. So that is an important point that you want to highlight as well, right. And uh, you know they began to export far more than they were importing, right. And so the developed states are saying, excuse me, what you asked for. Right, and versus what you are actually doing in terms of exporting, right, has got a discrepancy. So now you are if you are expecting certain concessions from us as developed states, right, the same thing should technically apply to you, right? Because you see, they were importing, uh, sorry, uh, they were exporting far more than they were importing, right? And developed wealthier countries start demanding that they also lower the import barriers because then it becomes less competitive. All right. So the developed countries are saying that. You are claiming developing country status, but and you are asking for these concessions, right? But you are basically on par, or, or, or you know, close to you know what we are doing. So therefore, what applies to me as developed state should technically also apply to you if you are talking about fair, right? Well, decades of unfairness that you know has actually plagued these negotiations between developed and developing states, right? Developed and developing states. Uh, that one, you know swept under the rug. But when it came to this round, right, when they start to see, oh, you know, these states are catching up, right, and, you know, maybe should be, you know, labeled, you know, in similar categories as us, then they start to point out all of these things, right? So developing countries, you know, of course, rightly, they've complained for decades that these kinds of subsidies that were being made available to the European or to the American markets, right, have, you know, basically prevented them from competing very fairly, right, with the Western states or with the global north and so on, right? So... So what happens, right, is that you have this tussle between these two camps, right? And that's exactly, you know, what you saw, uh, you know, with countries like China and India, right? So, for example, uh, China, India, they refused, they wanted to stick to the original principles. US, Europe are saying, we need to change, you know, the way we're approaching, you know, giving out subsidies because you're coming on board in terms of stature, economic stature, right? But, you know, uh, the developing countries are saying, for many, many years, right, we've never been able to compete fairly. So now we have already have an endemic problem of food security, right? And in taking away these subsidies or taking away the ability of, of us to have these subsidies or making it on par with you is going to exacerbate the existing problems you already have. You understand the logic? Simple logic. 
right? So what happens is that you know within you know the the WTO itself, right? In you know all of these negotiations, what you start to see is a cleavage, right? That means a division that arises between on one camp you have US, EU, and Japan on one side. On the other side, right? You've got China, India, Brazil, South Korea, Africa, South Africa, right? Within the WTO itself. So US, EU, Japan on one side, right? There's a, a cleavage that is arising, right? So US, Japan, uh, EU on one side, and then you've got China, India, Brazil, South Korea, uh, South Africa you know, on, on the other camp altogether. And they are, not, they are all not on the same page, right? And if you are going to have states that are all, all not on the same page, right, then what does that contribute to? You're going to exacerbate the inability to come to a conclusion, correct? Because now you're broken up into camps. This goes against the spirit of? Of? Goes against the spirit of what? Ah, correct. Multilateralism. <laughs> Why are you also hesitant to answer? Is it like not used to answering already, is it? Or not sure? <laughs> What's shy? You all technically know me, right? I, I may look very serious with the white hair, but it's, I'm still the same person. Right? I'm the same person. It's just I'm lazy to dye my hair. That's all. Nothing, nothing to it. Ah, this one, another one. Anonymity of online makes it easier to communicate. Very funny. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is where you get the failures of the Doha round, right? Okay, so it's considered the perception. Remember, we always talk about perception of states, right? So states are now perceiving that it's no longer fair, right? And this is already, this is where you start to see the cracks, right? Because the, the whole logic, the logic was to make trade fairer, right? And to reduce it, the, you know, the, the discrepancy between the, you know, the the uh, developing and the developed, right? Uh, so that's the logic now here, right? And and then, you know, you find that, that you know, exactly what, like, the video said. She said, you know, she pointed out, okay, since they came to the negotiations with the plan, if you give me all of these concessions relating to these, you know, e-commerce and government procurement and intellectual property rights, then I would, you know, barter with you and say that, okay, I'll give you the concessions otherwise. But that what does that do? That basically... Horse trading, right? You know, that, that phrase that she used, right? What does horse trading basically do? Horse trading is like, you know, I give you what you want. I get what I want, right? And what I want, obviously, is going to put me in an advantageous position. So instead of creating some semblance of fairness, right, you're basically just extracting concessions for whatever you want that would reiterate your advantageous position. For both developed and developing, right? Because now the developing states are also technically in an advantageous position. If you look at China and, and India, for instance, correct? Right? So that is where it starts to, you know, um, get problematic because they say, we will only negotiate if you give us what we want, right? So that, again, already, you know, is already problematic. So, like I said just now, if you're going to lay blame on the organisation, right, who do you attribute the blame to? So failure of the Doha round, failure of the WTO, is it because the WTO did not have uh, the ability to uh, override these you know, uh, 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 you know, issues, it wasn't able to settle the disputes? Or is it because you had these states who were wearing their realist lenses and thinking about you know, the domestic situation back home right, and wanting to appeal to the electoral basis? Right? And how does it look like, you know, if you're selling out, are you selling out your farmers on a global stage? Which is what, you know, India was actually very concerned about. Are they going to be seen, is Mo was Modi going to be seen as selling out, you know, his farmers on a global stage by acquiescing to these demands that were being made on an international uh, platform? Right, so that is the you know the issue down here. So talks, you know, basically, uh, you know, reached you know like a stalemate in about two thousand and eight. Then they started to renegotiate in Bali in uh, 2013, 2014, and basically citing food security issues. Right, that's where you get the standoff. Right, so you know uh, the, the India the India one that I'm telling you about. Right. So uh, it was an important election year. So that's why I always tell you the timing, the timeline, sometimes is very important to make reference. So students would just, you know, say, oh, you know, it, it was about selling farmers off on the stage. But why? Why does it become such a critical issue to deal with? Because it's an important election year. 
right? So that's where, you know, you have that logic that we have explained to start off with. These issues are actually weaponized on a domestic level, right? So with, you know, uh, Modi's impending election and, uh, you know, and that was when they delivered that crushing blow to Congress, which the Congress political party, right, in India, uh, which had prior to that basically... Uh, ruled with, you know, basically almost un unbroken rule, if I'm not wrong, uh, from, I think, about the 1970s, if I got my Indian politics correct, right? It's a, I think around that, right? So, you know, cons uh, you know this was like a, uh, what, what was it called? Um, a, land, uh, a landslide win, right, for the BJP, right, which uh, Modi is from, right, okay? And, uh, you know, that's why you see, you know, it becomes a, a political card for India, right? And, you know, did not like what, I, I like that phrase, they did not want to look like they were selling out their farmers on a global stage, right? So, and then, you know, subsequently, it was not just, you know, on rice, it was also, uh, I think, on sugar as well. That was another important uh, uh, product, right? Uh, US versus India versus, uh, and then you had Australia versus India on sugar production as well. Sugar, rice, crops, all of these things, right? Sugar in particular, it's an integral good, right? That both developed and developing countries need. Develop um, uh, countries which have uh, large food production conglomerates like your Nestle, uh, Nest Nestle and your know, Coca-Cola and all of this, right? Sugar is an integral ingredient, right? For all of these processed foods as well. So of course, there's going to be a sticking point Right, uh, for a lot of these uh, developed states, right, because it has to do with the the MNC lobbies, right, that are or the TNC lobbies that are in their domestic country as well. So you can you see it's not just a a, a global issue, you know, it has you have to make that connection between what's happening domestically, what are the requirements domestically, and then you know map it onto a global level. Okay, all right. So then subsequently. Uh, you know, you had other developing countries, right, which were also uh, now, you know, experiencing this divide, right? I mean, the, 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 sorry, the developing camp, right, was all, also experiencing this, this divide. So you got Thailand, Pakistan, right, uh, Uruguay, right, which are all, you know, major exporters, uh, you know, of rice. Now they, you know, are arguing, right, if you've got overpaid farmers in India and overpaid farmers as a result, well, how do you get overpaid farmers? Because they're receiving... Subsidy, right? That's why I wanted to explain the logic of, you know, how the subsidy contributes to the, you know, the, the, the prices that they're able to sell at. You understand the logic now here? All right, okay. So the overpaid farmers, right, um, you know, would then, un in India, right, if they're continuing to receive these subsidies, right, then that would undercut the way that the farmers in India, you know, Pakistan, uh, sorry, India, Pakistan, Thailand, Pakistan, Uruguay, uh, we also produce because they're all producing the same good, right? So if you have concessions extended to one, then there's, then that goes against your reciprocity, most favoured nation principle logic, right? Because the same treatment has to be extended to all of the goods at the same time, right? right? And all the countries at the same time, all right? You cannot extend concessions to one without extending concessions to the other, right? Which, you know, it, it doesn't make sense anymore. So India was asking for allowances that is, you know, going against the spirit of, you know, what free trade was basically about, right? So that becomes, you know, an extremely problematic, you know, issue. So uh, eventually they, you know, managed to, re uh, you know, reach, you know, an agreement and they say, okay, fine, right? Uh, you know, let them, you know, uh, be given these concessions. You don't disturb the existing structure, right? Until about, you know, 2017. And, they, you know, India also made a promise, you know, at the talks to say that, okay, we will not, you know, contribute to distorting the production anymore. What was interesting, right, uh, you know, in, in this, uh, you know, uh, development, Developments, right, is that you start to see the developing countries, you know, have a, a more prominent uh, role that is being played in the negotiations. Very large voice, right? Okay, you know, in comparison to other organizations, you find that the voices of the developing states, right, tend to be a bit more muted in comparison to the developed states. So that is one interesting point that, you know, you want to, um, you know, uh, include. Other implications of the breakthrough? Right, uh, you've got a reform uh, pact. You know, uh, since the first time we have a reform pact, uh, you know, in WTO since uh, 1995, right? And then you know, all of them agreed, you know, to say that okay, we will you know take note of the existing frameworks that are relating to uh, barriers to entry. All right, and what was very significant, like what I pointed out to you earlier, on the voice of the developing states starts to become very loud. Why? Because for the first time. Right, developing states actually outnumbered the industrialized developed states in uh, in the WTO. That's why you get 
the you know the voice is is really you know so loud in comparison to what you've seen before, right? And um, you know, as a result of you know these uh you know consist inconsistencies in the negotiations, what you also saw was that you know um very uh, you know your your developed countries uh you know were becoming very apprehensive of the rise of the de- what did I say? Did I say developed countries? The developed countries. I'm sorry. Uh, let me backtrack. The developed countries, right, were already becoming apprehensive about the rise of the developing states because number one, they're they're all rising very rapidly. Number two, right, what you also had was an issue where a lot of these developed states, right, they had already faced some losses as a result of labor-intensive manufacturing being shifted to develop developing countries. There's even exodus, right? So the you know because it's cheaper to produce in developing countries because it's more lax in terms of regulations like environmental regulation, corporate tax is lesser, labor is cheaper, right? You can set up shop, set up factory quite easily, correct? So that's the rationale down here, right? So what you see is that you know uh, they were already experiencing, you know, they had already experienced the developed countries had already experienced losses. So the developed countries, as a result, if you have already experienced losses and you've already had sh- bases of manufacturing shifted to the uh, developing countries, What? how do you think they're going to modify their domestic uh, policies relating to trade? Are they going to be more open and receiving to these developing countries and lower barriers? Then well, how are they going to be like? How are they going to be like? They're going to shift from being open to being... Huh? Protection is in nature. Right. Right. That's the logic down here. Okay. Correct, Jill. More, more uh, protectionist in nature. Right. Uh, see, this is all the drama that you do not see you know, when you're online. The amount of drama that happens, you know, in my room with the aircon and with the, you know, with the, the renovators upstairs and whatever, whatever, right? You do not see any of that. You just, you know, just you just hear me cough and drink water and that's about it. But you don't see all of this. <sighs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and, and also, right, um, what you start to see, right, you know, is that it, it becomes quite um, embarrassing you know, on a global platform because you're negotiating, negotiating. And it's like amazing that, you know, can you actually get anything done or not at all, right? So that is, you know, a, a pro, uh, you know it's a, you know, uh, an achievement to even think that you can have so many negotiations, right? And, um, you know, it tends to, you know, um, slide to irrelevance, right? And also the other problem is that, uh, you know, in comparison uh, to the successes of other kinds of trade agreements that were occurring on a bilateral level, or a plurilateral level, like free trade agreements or regional agreements that were occurring among states, you know, outside of the WTO or outside the outside the Doha negotiation round, right? It's like you can make headway there, but you can't, you know, make any headway down here because of the numerous obstacles, you know, that are occurring. So, you know, those were beginning to be seen as more realistic alternatives, which is why, right? If you like Google, say for example, if you just Google randomly, Doha Development Round WTO. Uh, evaluation or, or, you know, just, just, you know, if you just Google it, right, you will stumble upon articles that, you know, are actually are titled, uh, why is the Doha round a failure? There's a lot of criticism associated with the Doha development round, right, because of this, you know, so for, for many, it is actually considered to be a failure, right, because they were not able to settle a lot of these issues, okay? All right. <clears throat> So 2013, uh, 2014, right, they made the breakthrough with India, right? And then after that, you know, don't really see, you know, much of, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, progress, right? Uh, you know, until, you know, um, say about 2015, right? So that, you know, was uh, a problem. So, you know, the problems associated with the negotiations as a result of the discrepancy between, uh, you know, the, the uh, what's that? the developed and the developing states, right, then translated into the fact that the WTO basically has become irrelevant and failed. So that means what happens is that when people, when or when critics, right, uh, criticize the WTO, right, particularly in this period, it's actually a criticism of the Doha development round, 
rather than the failure of the WTO itself. You do not make the same mistake in your exam answer. Right, so specifically, you know, mentioned right. If you're talking about critic, uh, criticism, or if you're talking about you know failure, right, then what you want to specifically highlight is that you know um, it's more to do with you know the impasse that resulted in the negotiations as a result of these you know developed and developing states being selfish on a global platform. Right, because they are trying to extract concessions for themselves rather than the failure of the organization per se. Failure of the organization per se is because, you know, think about the logic. I know some people will be tempted to say, but you know, it's a failure of the organization because the organization cannot push these states, right, to accept these, you know, agreements and, and make it binding and, and legal. Then go back to the logic of what IOs are about and what global governance and multilateralism is about. What is the Original definitions of these. If you go by those original definitions, right, is, is global governance about forcing and being able to push states to carry out a particular activity? No, correct. Multilateralism also not, right? It is about helping to facilitate interaction among states who have a common goal. Correct? That's what international organizations are about. Right? They're a platform, they're a forum, they're a repository of information. This is where I see the disconnect right, in students who write a descriptive answer versus an analytical answer. Because if you are, if you are writing a descriptive answer, you basically verbal vomit all of these things that are on the slide down here. This is the content, correct? But if you want to write an analytical answer to critique, right, you will be basically saying that, okay, the issue here is that I'm critiquing WTO, but what is the function of an international organization? If you look at the function of international organizations, can they force sovereign states to do their bidding or not? Cannot. That's what sovereign, that's why states are sovereign. That is why they have can find escape clauses and loopholes in these negotiations. Correct? Right? Logic, right? So you go back to the idea of global governance and what the function of international organizations actually are. All right, then you will be able to have a more nuanced argument. So yes, correct. You know the maybe the the institutions and the regime building uh, strength, right, uh, and the ability for the WTO, for example, in this instance, right, to perpetuate these norms, right, relating to free trade, uh, was not something that they were able to do so well. So yes, you know because we say the international organizations are norm entrepreneurs. They're supposed to convince states, right, and they push states in the correct direction. This is accepted behavior. This is not accepted behavior. Correct. Yes, we agree about that, right? But at the end of the day, the final success of these negotiations actually lies in whose hands? The WTO's hands, per se, or the member states' hands, per se. So you need to make that, that distinction. Students don't make that distinction. They'll just say, WTO failed, IMF failed, World Bank failed. Okay, yeah, World Bank failed, IMF failed, because they didn't think carefully about, you know, the... the, the um, the capacity of those that are borrowing money from it. Correct. Yes, I agree on that aspect. But in the first place, whose responsibility is it to ensure good economic management, sound financial institutions, good governance in a domestic state? Is it the job of an international organization? It's not. Right. It is the job of the domestic uh, leaders, right? They are the ones who are supposed to take care of distribution of goods and services. They are the ones who are supposed to ensure that they are, the development of you know, uh, institutions is sound. Correct? So that is where you know, students put, place too much blame. Right? You know, I, basically, I'm the opposite of what Mia Shaima says. Right? Mia Shaima says we've invested too much faith in international organizations. You know? And then what you need to do is think about that. You know? Yeah, okay, we've invested a lot of faith in international organizations because we feel that they can, you know, they're like harbinger. You know, like, you know, all the you know angels in the heavens open up and the angels all sing, you know, and can solve all the problems. But you know, that's besides the point. The logic is who's you know, it's like you know, when your mother looks at you and says, you know, who created this mess to start off with? You are the one who made the mess, right? You clean it up, right? You do expect me to come and clean up the mess for you, right? Same logic, same analogy. Don't write this in your exam answer. Same I I I I say this, you know why? Because I actually see these kinds of things in the prelim papers and I get very, very worried. I don't know whether students are pranking me. Because you know that I'm, I I like I mark their brilliant papers for, for for this course sometimes, right? So I'm not sure whether they prank me because they will write messages like, "I'm very sorry, I only wrote one answer. I didn't have time to finish studying and all these kinds of things." So I'm not sure. In your final exam, uh, don't don't make jokes, huh? And don't write hypothetical questions. Don't don't write a question to the examiner, uh? 
and, and say like, you know, like, oh, with the, you know, protectionist policies, you know, trying to sound sophisticated, it doesn't work. As, as honestly, as a reader and as a marker, I find it a bit irritating in the sense that you basically put the question there and attempt to sound sophisticated, but you didn't answer the question at all. Question is for you or me to answer. You, you get what I, you understand what I mean? Uh, so think about that uh, carefully when you are phrasing your answers. I know it sounds good, la, right? You know, when you like when you read journal articles, you know, they've got these questions at the end of the paper, right? I know it does sound good, but for an exam, I would not recommend that. Okay? All right. Okay, so this is, you know, the overall problems, right? You know, we've already kind of explained this already. So you've got, you know, there's, there's no solidarity. Already you have a discrepancy between developed and developing. Then you have discrepancy within developing as well, right? So there's, you know, uh, uh, this mask of solidarity is actually, you know, breaking down already. And, uh, you know, when they are all on the same page and extracting concessions for themselves, then you are not going to be able to go forward with any kind of constructive proposals regarding trade liberalization, right? Then you also have the transformation, like what I mentioned, countries like China, India, right, and other developing states, right? Uh, basically, they are transforming, you know, beyond recognition during this round. Hey, the aircon actually got colder. Did they hear us? Right, it actually got colder, right? I'm feeling more comfortable now. Okay. <laughs> and US in particular, uh, you know, was, you know, really, you know, spineless because they didn't want to seem, they didn't want, like India, right? They didn't want to be seen as antagonizing their own agricultural sector back home as well. So, you know, they're, you know, kind of like spineless and they are, you know, asking, you know, just like how the developing countries are asking for, uh, you know, all of this market access, right, in turn, in return for subsidies cut domestically. So logic is that if you do not give me access to the markets, right, that would further advantage me, who is already in an advantageous position, because remember, the core the and the periphery, remember the logic, right? So US belongs to the core, right? So they are asking for even more market access. You want me to cut subsidies, right? Okay, give me extra market access. So, does that go towards trade liberalization? No. So this is what you need to come back to. What is the goal of the WTO, right? And how all of these negotiations keep not fulfilling that goal, right? If you do not, so in your exam answer, in the either in the intro paragraph or the paragraph after the introduction when you finish talking about, you know, the breakdown of the question, right? If you do not talk about, you know, the main aim being trade liberalization and evening out this imbalance, right? Your, these arguments, right, will not, you know, make too much sense, okay? All right. Global level, right, basically, you know, you, uh, you know, seeing that, uh, you know, this has contributed to instability because, you know, it, for, it, it, it lays bare, right, the true intentions of a, lot of, of a lot of these states in participating, you know, in an organization like this. So, you know, uh, developed countries, like I mentioned, you know, they wanted to include all of these higher level economic uh, you know, activities and issues into <clears throat> the negotiation rounds, whereas, you know, your developing countries like India had strong opposition. They want to solve the original agenda, right? And then what you also see is that um, these deals, uh, you know, like what we discussed just now with the US scenario, right? They're often one-sided agreements, right? With the originally more stronger state or the advantaged state, right? Trying to, you know, um, you know, uh, dominate the way these agreements are being written, right, versus, you know, uh, a weaker signatory, right, who is attend you know, attempting to, you know, make these negotiations. So basically, what you see is that, you know, this these multilateral deals, right, now, uh, you know, are helping to facilitate the voice of this discrepancy instead of, you know, facilitating trade liberalization, right? So basically, you're creating a lot of undesirable side effects. And, you know, that's where you start to see uh, the spawning of these mega regionals, right? Like the 2015 TPP, right? Which are being seen as like better alternatives, right? So the logic is that, you know, some critics and some of the states came to this conclusion. Might it actually be better to allow bilateral or plurilateral and, you know, deals you know, and, and, you know, instead of trying to multilateralize every issue, right, you know, and, you know, and trying to, you know, force uh, all of these, you know, uh, deals, right, that are, you know, so fraught with complications to the point where you always are consistently reaching a stalemate, right? You cannot, you know, move forward. So, you know, countries like India also resist such moves, right, you know, and it makes it very difficult, uh, you know, to amend the, the agenda, right? So the, the gap between the developed and developing continues to grow. Right? So that's why, you know, I talked about, you know, um, as, as an overall conclusion, can you come to any kind of, you know, um, 
conclusion to say that the WTO has helped to uh, reduce right, the inequalities that exist between the Global North and the Global South. Right? And, in, and you use the Doha developing round and the various examples related to it as an example to illustrate how this gap has not been reduced. Okay? All right. So don't just tell the story, right? Don't just. Uh, these are very important because I I find that students will just replicate, right, all of these different examples, right, and as part of like they think that it's evidence, right, to highlight that they have you know pointed out that the this is why the gap between the developed and developing exists. But you need to take the argument one step further, right, to say that you know the 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 obstacles and the stalemates that were experienced in the Doha development round is an illustration as to why the WTO has not been able to successfully reduce the discrepancy between global north and global south or you know, reduce the inequalities, you know, whichever the question is demanding for. So you use that as an illustration, not 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 just tell the story as it is. Okay, important, right? Because these kinds, you know, there's so much information, right? It's about shaping the information to answer the question. So you can you can give blow by blow account. You can go and read, you know, Kant's Mings and Styles or any other, you know, uh, like WTO has got, you know, tons of PDF reports, right? All the different negotiations. You can put everything inside. You know, you won't have time, like you won't have the word limit to do so also. You can put everything inside. Does it answer the question or not? Okay? How is this just, you know, an additional statement or a phrasing, right? Okay? So therefore, the fail, you know, one is that, you know, the failure of Doha, you know, was actually, was, was basically translated and seen to be a failure of WTO. But at the same time, when there are failures, when you hit rock bottom, right? The only way, the only way, the next step is, on, is what? If you hit rock bottom already, what does that tell you? The next step is to go up, right? Right? So that's the logic. When you talk about you know, failures of an organization or failures of a negotiating round, what does that tell you? These are the shortcomings. Shortcomings tell you what is it that you need to do in order to address them. Right? So that's why we say right, this opened the door to discussing newer issues right? because you know what the problems are. So you laid everything you know, open already. Right? So that is basically, you know, what, uh, you know, the, the significance of the Doha round is. So also, I'm going to tell you the kind of, kind of softer, gentler view. Don't always, you know, just critique only, right? You know, so this is the, the you know, that, that softening, uh, you know, argument that says, okay, right? Yes, failures, okay. But, you know, it basically helps us to see, you know, what are the shortcomings? How can we move forward? From, from here onwards, okay? All right? So, you know, like, for example, uh, you know, some of the agreements, right, when they were negotiating was a global ban on farming uh, export um, at subsidies, right? Basically, what they were looking at is that um, these this global ban on these export subsidies was hailed by the international community and uh, EU as a milestone for WTO and subsequently was a basis, right, uh, you know, to show that multilateral consensus is, uh, you know, possible because eventually they all came to the conclusion, okay, fine. This is banned on these subsidies. All right. Okay. Um, and but what happened was, you know, at this point, this is what you know sounded the death knell for Doha. And you know, basically say, okay, we need to, you know, rethink this idea of trade multilateralism. Because if we continue in the same direction, you are only going to have a repeat of the Doha round, right? If you don't make any, you know, uh, adjustments subsequently. All right. So that you know is the argument behind uh Doha. Yeah, sorry, Joe, correct up. <laughs> no, then I see it. Martin, I see. I was looking at the class, sorry. Yes, yes, you're correct. You're correct. Okay, so this is, you know, just, uh, um, you know, I, I know it's very small. But subsequently, right, when you all come to class, uh, you know, for, for lecture, maybe, you know, bring a printout or a soft copy of your notes because I, I have to have the thing open like that because I, I, I need to see the chat. All right, so uh, I, I know it's very small, things like this, right? Uh, bring a soft copy if you um, don't have, uh, I mean, if you're not going to print it out. Okay, all right, I forgot to tell you just now. Okay, so now we want to look at some of the bodies, right? I'm not going to run through every single slide here because, because you know, you can basically read it, uh, all right? Um, and a lot of the questions will not really, you know, ask you to give a blow-by-blow -blow account of, uh, you know, like exactly what the different organs or the bodies within uh, the organization is. Maybe, you know, if this is more relevant for organizations like the UN, for instance, because each of these, you know, individual bodies are relevant, right, in the UN. Uh, for some of the other organizations, you can have a quick summary of it. Like, okay, these are the main decision-making uh, structures, right? I would focus more on the decision-making structures, the real, because that's where, 
that's where the real action actually is, right? So decision making structures, uh, and the 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 explanation of like say for example, uh, the which which are the parts of the organization that have the platform that function as a platform for the states to you know uh, raise issues of you know function as a forum and so on. That one. And the third one, which is important to highlight, which, which will be the um, dispute resolution mechanism. So, you know, among all of the different structures, right, this is where your focus really should be on if you're going to expand the arguments. Otherwise, you know, some of these other things that, you know, you know, talk about the general counsel and all, right, you can summarize some of these ideas or sometimes you can just, you know, move past it, depending on what the question is asking you for, right? If you get a question that is specifically on dispute resolution mechanism within the WTO, then of course, you know, a bit of background as to... Uh, where the dispute resolution mechanism is located in that whole structure would be something that is relevant to include. All right. So again, depending on the question, like I say, you know, for your for this course, right? Not every single thing, uh, in every you know, every single part of the chapter is directly relevant to the question. All right. So don't go about replicating the entire chapter because it depends on what they're asking you for. So if they're specifically talking about globalization, inequalities between developed, developing states uh, and negotiations, then all of this is also not relevant. Maybe when it comes to the dispute resolution me mechanism, the, the, the DSB, the uh, dispute settlement body, that will be relevant because, again, that talks about you know, the discrepancy between the developed and the developing states, right? But other things that related to the structure need not necessarily be put in your exam answer. So know what to put in and take out, right, according to the question, okay? All right, so you've got the TPRB, right, which is the uh, Trade Policy Review Body, right, and specifically you're going to look at the DSB later on, right? So your TPRB is considered to be an institutional uh, innovation, right? What you want to uh, explain, right, uh, is like if the general counsel, right, gives... WTO, the political prominence that GET doesn't have, what the TPRB also gives uh, WTO that, you know, what, the, what GET didn't have, right, was that, um, you know, it gives the ability to uh, function as a, in, a, you know, a repository of information, right? So, you know, like, just like how we describe World Bank and IMF, uh, you know, uh, when, you know, like for World Bank and IMF, when they release reports on poverty statistics or they release reports on business-friendly environments or, uh, you know, governance strengths of individual states, right? Similar to that, that's your TPRB, right? So it's created as a central body that collects, reviews, disseminates all your trade-related information, you know, from states for states. Highlight down there. This is only something that an I.O. can do. Individual states cannot do this by themselves, right? So this is relevance of WTO as an international organization, right? This is something that states cannot perform this function on their own, okay? So the WTO members, they are obliged to inform, uh, you know, the you know, WTO and other member states of, you know, any kind of development domestically relating to trade, like, you know, any kind of trade policy revisions, uh, measures, Ismail, do you have a question to ask? Yes. No need to ask permission, anybody, uh, if you want to go out or anything. All right, just, just go. Okay? All right, this is just normal uh, normal convention with me. All right? Of course, just don't get up and go uh, and go home. Right? You know? Okay? Yeah. Unless, you know, I have overshot the lecture and without realising. There was one lecture. I somehow thought that lecture finished at 330 I was happily talking, you know. Then I see people packing up and going. And I was like, so rude. I was, I was thinking to myself, so rude. I'm still explaining something. Then finally, I realized. Because I had another lecture after that. And I was like, Oosh, my next lecture is at 3.30. And I'm thinking this one finishes at 3.30. Uh, yeah, so if I do something stupid like that, yes, you know, please let me know. Uh, but otherwise, just, you know, go. You know, if you need to get a drink or you need to go to the toilet or something. Okay? All right. Um, and if you put up your hand, please put up your hand properly. Like, you know, just now, I, was like, I wasn't sure whether he was... You know, adjusting his hair, putting up the hand. I cannot tell from here. Uh, okay. Um, okay, what was I saying? Uh, yeah, so, you know, this is something only that uh, an I.O. can do, right? You know, uh, uh, you know, states cannot do this by themselves. So, it goes back to the function of, uh, you know, an international organization. So, states' international trading behavior also subjected to regular peer review, right? Because, uh, you know, the rationale is that, you know, states can claim, you know, I've done X, Y, and Z, but, you know, they have to be subject to peer review. So, larger trading states like uh, the EU, US, Japan, China, 
see, yeah, Japan, China, right, are subject to these trading reviews on the same level, like EU and US, but they are still considered to be developing states and extract concessions like that. Can you see, you know, the discrepancy that actually exists, right? Uh, you know, it's not to say that, you know, it's unfair, right? But, you know, how... How do you reconcile these kinds of issues, right? And, you know, the logic is that, you know, exactly where do you park them? Because developing versus develop is a very dichotomous understanding of, of the economic stature and growth and development, correct? It's very dichotomous. You know, like, at what point do you consider something as developing versus developed? Or is it because it's Western? Or is it because it's been developed for a very long time? Right? So that is also quite problematic, right? That's something for you to think about. I do not know where you'll be able to use this, you know, in particular. But just think, hold on to this thought, you know, because if you're going to critique, you know, this logic of develop versus developing, maybe you could use it in an argument on globalization, for instance, right? Or you could use it on an argument that talks about, you know, the ever-widening gap, right? This could be like a, a comment that you can include in your uh, conclusion, you know, to say like, at the end of the day, what is developed and developing? Right, uh, it's a very highly dichotomous, you know, view of you know the uh, developments of the states, right? And you know, maybe if we if we come up with a more comprehensive framework, right, then maybe we'll be able to iron out some of these kinks a bit better. So that could be a comment. Of course, please don't you know find you know need feel that you feel need find that you feel the need to must include this kind of statement. Right, you don't always have to make a comment, but if you think that it's going to enhance your overall argument. Right, you know, dependent on the question, right? Then you know, feel free to make these kinds of comments. Okay, all right. So uh, logic down here is your larger trading states like EU, Japan, US, China, examined every two years. Your second tier trading nations, right, are uh, examined every four years, and then the vast majority every six years they are subjected to this peer review. All right. Uh, the, of course, you know, the larger ones are subjected to more frequent trade reviews because that level of economic activity is higher. Uh, you may see, uh, you know, uh, they may engage in, you know, um, more varied kinds of uh, economic activities as well, right? So it depends on how big they are, what's the size of growth, uh, you know, like according to your traditional uh, indicators, your growth indicators like GDP growth, inflation, unemployment, and so on, right? So that's why the larger countries are subject to it. Uh, your DSP, this is the one that's important, right? Okay, so um, make sure that you, uh, you know, uh, able to summarize some of these ideas down here. When you talk about the DSP, uh, it is one of the most important institutional innovations, right? Something that GET did not have. GET simply functioned as a forum Right, for the states to air their grievances relating to disputes arising. But GET did not have the institutional ability, did not have the teeth, it was didn't have the legal basis, right, because it was simply a regime, right, to be able to deal with dispute resolution effectively. So this is really an innovation and one step up, right, for WTO vis-a-vis -vis GET. Understand? Right, and this is one of the only because because get uh, sorry WTO is the only trade related organization, which means this is the only trade related dispute settlement body as well, which is why everything came to a standstill when the U.S. started blocking right in Trump's reign. The U.S. started blocking the appointment of the judges to the appellate body, which is in the dispute res, uh, dispute settlement body. You understand the logic? So that's why it becomes so critical. Okay. All right, so, uh, you know, make sure that you explain, right, that, you know, uh, what does it do? It strengthens your legal, your, it strengthens your trading regime, right, as a result of being able to settle disputes in a juridical manner. And it therefore contributes to international law, specifically looking at the trade aspect of international law. All right, so that's why we say strengthen legal framework within which international trade disputes can be adjudicated. Uh, if I were you, and if I was writing this in the exam, I would use the entire phrase. I would not, you know, do this, uh, you know, paraphrasing uh, because you may lose the meaning of it. All right, so this becomes, you know, significant. Right. So in this case, if you have a trade dispute, the parties are obligated to forego these unilater unilateral sanctions. So it's not like you know I'm not friends with you anymore, but you come to the dispute resolution, uh, uh, sorry, the dispute settlement body, right, and you start the proceedings. Okay. All right, so this one is, you know, important because it is a legalization. 
right? Again, important phrase to pay attention to. It's a legalization of international dispute settlement instead of slapping sanctions on each other or closing, right? Reducing barriers to entry, right? Instead of doing that, basically what you're doing is you're legalizing it, okay? So that becomes important also. So you are trying to resolve the disputes in an amicable way, right? So can you see these are the important phrases that you must use? Even if you paraphrase, right? These are the phrases that you must include. Right, by way of consultation, right? And they have a panel, and then you know the, the accused states and the and the and the, the other you know uh, states can you know basically come to uh, presenting their cases, right? It runs through uh, several rounds, okay. The investigation will basically you know uh, commence and then they can solve the problem, you know, um uh, you know amicably, right? So this is like a you know uh, ad hoc tribunal in the sense that you have judges that are appointed to this um uh, tri uh, the panels, right, based on, you know, their expertise. So they could be, uh, you know, have expertise in international law, trading law, you know, e-commerce and so on like that. But, you know, uh, what, what becomes a little bit, uh, you know, um, uh, problematic is who gets to use these dispute resolution panels, right? Because it's, it's available to everybody to use. Right, but we need to then consider, right? What you know, go go. I've given you a link. Uh, it's in the next slide, right? You know, go and take a look at that link, right? Which are the states that tend to open up, uh, you know, cases with the dispute settlement body, right? Which category do they belong to? Developed or developing? Okay, All right. Which are the states who are mooting a lot of these, you know, accusations and saying, you know, the other state is, you know, engaging in unfair trading practices. That is important, right? So while we, you know, start off our, our explanation here by saying that, okay, this is the, I, ideally, this is what the function of the dispute settlement body is, then your analysis will start to take into consideration all of these other issues, right? Okay. All right. So when you look at this, right, you will notice that, um, you know, they are looking at the panel report, the appellate, uh, appellate body will start to hear, you know, the, the appeals and so on. Right. And if you look, uh, you know, I've got some of the examples here for you. I've got, you know, one example, a case study here. And then I've got a list of disputes as well right, from the WTO website. Just take a look at it to give yourself a sense. Right. Uh, and then you will see uh, as of 2018, right, about 573 requests were made. Uh, 249, you know, led to panel reports. So 573, only about half of it basically makes it to the panel reports, right? The EU and the US are often either the complainant or the respondent. Basically, problem children, right? Okay, that, that's the logic down here, right? And China's share has also rapidly been increasing. Why? Because these, what, why? Are they, is it because they are problem children, problem children? I mean, they are, but, uh, you know, what, what is also the rationale down here? Why is it that China, US and EU are the ones that seem to be named either as complainants or respondents? Because, common sense will tell you what. Why China, US and EU? Huh? Major stakeholders, they are the ones who have trading relations also, no, no, correct, you're correct, you're correct. They are, but they are the ones who also have trading relations with a majority of other states. Correct, right? As I say, common sense, simple argument. Y'all sometimes, I think, think too much. I actually ask very simple questions. You realize that, right? And then you all think, 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 and then you have no answer, but actually the answer is right there in your face. Right? <laughs> okay? And the issue here is that your developing countries seem to hardly participate given the trend. Why do you think so? Why do you think so? Simple answer. Why do you think so? Yeah, correct, Ipan. Biggest market share. <laughs> Sorry, I delayed reaction. Yeah. yeah. Why? Why do? You, why do you think developing countries um hardly, hardly take uh, advantage of the DSP? Why do you think so? Okay. So fear of of, of repercussions. Right, because you're basically antagonizing these larger states, right? Who have got larger voices, who you are, who you are. If you're a developed con developing country, you are what on a developed state? Look at the logic of core, periphery, semi-periphery. The developing states have been pushed into a cycle of Let's play hangman. It starts with D. 
dependency, <laughs> right? Correct. That is the logic behind this, right? That is why we talked about the uh, core periphery and, and semi-periphery, right? Because, I mean, you are correct, you know, where does the extraction, they're extracting, right? But also what, the, what also happens, cycle of dependency, correct? Right? So you don't want to antagonize. Second point, which is actually the more critical point, I mean, you are correct, but the second point, which is very critical, it is very expensive for uh, states to actually lodge a complaint, right? It's very costly. It costs, uh, according to some of the reports I was reading, right? It costs about $500,000 US, if I'm presuming, right? Uh, to source for information and to lodge your case. You're already a developing state. You're fighting for concessions and negotiations or subsidies, right? Where are you going to take out $500,000 from Right, to pay for this dispute resolution, which may or may not be in your favour. And to top it off, like what Gabriel already mentioned, there's this fear of jeopardising a relationship that exists right, between the developed and the developing, say, if they're going to moot uh, you know, a dispute uh, uh, settlement on them. Right? So you know, if they're unable to cause a settlement that will be in the developing state's favour, then basically you are, you are dependent on the other state for trading and market access, for employment, right, labor and so on. Then you go and antagonize. Then you pay the money to have this, you know, uh, you know, a case brought forward. Then you lose the case. Then what happens? Uh, wait, yeah, waste, uh, correct. Uh, waste your time also. And then you're, you know, in the <laughs> losing end, correct? Right? So why, why bother? So you have a mechanism that is available. What about the access to the mechanism? So you can say, right, it works. It's very good to have the dispute resolution mechanism, right? Who uses it? How is the, uh, the access, right, uh, you know, structured, right? Does everybody get to access it equally? Are they, uh, you know, uh, willing to do so? If they're not willing to do so, why are they not willing to do so? So just to say, oh, you know, uh, developing states don't use it. Why? What is the rationale behind it? Understand? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Effects. Okay. So you know we have uh, you know looked at a lot of these arguments already, right? So you know. Uh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Um. Uh, before I forget, let me go back to this slide. All right. What is this? What is this? Weaker than dependent on developed states, but still can't buy HDB in Singapore. Huh? What still can't buy HDB? Oh, the miss that is even more expensive. Oh, your five hundred thousand dollars. Can. Look at look. And what you are arguing? Who said you cannot buy five? You cannot buy HDB uh, for five hundred k or less. Can right actually? Before I shoot my mouth off, then, huh? Cannot uh? Can right? Okay like Maybe like two room, three room, right? I still don't know. I never bothered to go and look at all of this. When I when I did want to look at the condos, right? Well, I almost died. You know, I vom vomited in my mouth because it's like two room and then it's like eight hundred thousand dollars and like where am yeah. Die, die, you know, until, until the end of your life, you know, you cannot finish paying for it. <laughs> anyway, Ethan, you don't distract me, can it not? Oh, no, we got one HDB coming out of the, you know, coming into the argument, right? You will come to class next week, you. Then I will deal with you. Are you in the, in the, in the physical group? Or are you hiding behind the, the like what you say, the anonymity? <laughs> are you burn? All right. Okay, uh, but good, la, you know, at least you know, I know people are awake, right? Okay, that, that's the most important thing down here. A very dry topic, right, actually, if you think about it, right? All these topics are very dry. Can you imagine, you know, how I am attempting to make it entertaining or not? You know how difficult I am, right? Okay, I don't know how difficult it is for me, not how difficult I am, right? Okay, so the logic here uh, is that, you know, you're looking at the idea of, uh, the, remember I just now talked about the legalization, right? The legalization aspect. So that is the institutional effect, right? You're putting it into place. International law becomes more, free, uh, more important in the pursuit of free trade, right? And when you look at the DSP as a judicial forum, right? This is an exercise of the norm. So remember, if you go back, to, you know, um, okay, go back to look looking at, remember Kresner? And then Kresner mapped out the different aspects of the norms, principles, uh, institutions, decision-making procedures, right, onto what a regime is about, remember? And there's an explanation. It is in your Bailey's textbook, 
Uh, you can look, I, I think I've mentioned it under GATS, in the GATS lecture. Take a look at that one. If it's not there, that means it's in the Bailey 6 book, right? Go back to looking at what, because it's explained, you know, uh, you know la layer by layer, right? So, of course, uh, you know, the, the expression, you know, the DSP is an expression of the institutionalization of this norm that, you know, explains that reliance on international law, right, is of absolute integral importance to solving any kind of dispute. Right, rising out of trade, right? So, you know, you're basically cementing it in other words, right? Okay, just like how we would say, uh, you know, the ICC, uh, International Criminal Court, or the Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and uh, what's that, the Yugoslavia, right? And the, you know, the, the placing of all of these different perpetrators, whether they are, you know, the president or whether they are the foot soldier, right? Placing, placing them on, you know, the stand and, and expecting them uh, and charging them. Right for crimes that they have committed, right? Uh, you know, is going to be something that uh, you know is an you know an expression of you know what is the meaning of crimes of against humanity? What is the meaning of you know being tried you know for crimes against uh, aggression? Even you can you can switch. You know, I heard from some class yesterday. You all can switch. I right. I've heard. Uh, you write to students at sim at edu sg, uh, and and I think there's an administrative fee of like fifty something dollars. Uh, and you can uh, ask them to uh, see whether you can uh, switch to a physical class. Somebody somebody else did it and was explaining this process. The students at sim.edu.sg, you know, the email address, you can write to them. Okay? Okay, I give you the info already, so you go and deal with it. <laughs> All right, so your DSB uh, is, uh, if you want the email address later, ask me. I will type it in the chat box for you. Remind me, okay? DSB hailed as a major advance in trade governance, right? Um, because what are you doing? If you have a legal framework, right, to address uh, all of these conflicts and these uh, discrepancies, right, then what are you doing? You're basically in the true spirit of liberal, you know, organizations, right? You're reducing levels of uncertainty, right? Because it's laying bare. These are the rules and regulations related to international trade. If you contravene any of these rules and regulations, right, then you can, you know, based on these legalities and these clauses, you can bring your case up to the D DSP. Right, and then based on what you know, those uh, uh, regulations relating to DSP, what are the formal procedures are, then you can you know have your case heard in front of the panel. You can subject it to you know the appeals uh, body and so on. Right, so that is why you know we're talking about decreasing uncertainty and increasing convergence of actors' expectation. You trans transgress right or contravene uh, you know an institution relating to free trade. I have the ability right to then. Uh, you know, um, address it. So I expect you, you know, as a member of WTO not to do so. You expect me as a member of WTO not to do so. So when, what, regardless of what your perceptions are, right, you know, if you're looking at it from a constructive point of view, regardless of, you know, what your uh, economic stature is, right, these actually help to reduce uncertainty. Every time you reduce, reduce uncertainty, what are you basically doing, right? You are actually attempting to have your expectations converge. This is a reiteration of norms, which is why we call organizations, right? Like, like WTO for in, in this instance, norm entrepreneur, right? And the, and it, you know, remember like your prisoner's dilemma logic, right? The more the norms are repeated and acted upon, the more entrenched, sticky they become, all right? And they just become like another, you know, I know unspoken, uh, you know, rule that everybody else follows, right? So, you know, the logic, you know, if you go by the social constructivist logic, remember, uh, I thought the answer is X, everybody else, else says the answer is Y, I also believe the answer is Y, right? The logic of socialization and, uh, sorry, uh, social persuasion, right? And socialization, right? Okay, right? You understand, huh? Okay. So this is where, you know, uh, it became problematic, right? Some of the challenges, right, that, you know, the WTO faces, right? So when you have, uh, you know, the need to reach consensus, but that is why we have the rounds that stall so often, right? So the need to reach consensus is another, you know, uh, stumbling block, right? Then, you know, a lot of reform proposals, like, you know, say, for example, when you looked at the Doha development round, you know, the states like India, for example, rejected proposals to include newer uh, issues of like e-commerce and government procurement in, in the negotiations, right? So reform proposals are rejected, continuously rejected. So cannot make any progress. So, you know, the attempt, you know, like what we said about League of Nations, 
right, the, the rationale about, you know, attempting to reach consensus was one of the stumbling blocks, right, for the success and the progress of the organization. Same logic down here, right? When you expect to, and, and think about it, uh, consensus base with the number of members, over 160 plus members, right, who are all of differing capacities, they have differing interests, they are of differing economic stature as well, right? So it's not just, you know, a huge number of states who are all like-minded. They all have different interests. They're all pursuing different things at different times, right? Failure of Doha, right, was basically seen, you know, as to be a failure of multilateralism, right? It was seen as, you know, overly ambitious. Uh, you had, you know, the preponderance of the US and the EU officials. You had, you know, um, an inability to solve a lot of these um uh, a lot of these issues relating to subsidies and uh, you know agriculture, basically because they have been weaponized on a domestic level, right? And states were using you know uh, you know the Doha round as a leverage, right? Uh, you know to push you know their their domestic agendas as well, right? Okay, then you have the rise of plurilateralism. We've talked about this before, right? But, you know, the logic is that, you know, the number of uh, regional trade agreements or bilateral trade agreements has mushroomed, which, you know, uh, then, you know, suggests that, okay, why then do you want to continue to, you know, belabor and beleaguer the issue, right, by, you know, continuously referring to, uh, you know, um, the, the need to have multilateral agreement and all of these issues, right? So, you know, what it is, what plurilateralism does is it increases the level of complexity, right, in, uh, in, a, in a global trading environment because then you have overlaps, Right, you have states, some states who have already negotiated and you know extracted whatever concessions, extracted whatever you know um, positives that they want, and then when they come back to the negotiating table, they find that you know you know this negotiation is not giving me the kind of results that I would have otherwise gotten, you know, in a plurilateral agreement. Right, so that is why you know we say that it increases problems of coordination and competition. Right, and then it makes it even more longer, right, to solve all of these problems on a global level. WTO's lack of monitoring ability, right? Like what I asked you just now, you know, whose responsibility really is it, right? Who's, you know, um, who should bear the blame, right? So of course, you know, you know, if you say states lack lack of compliance with, uh, you know, the rules, and already they have an issue where it is difficult to enforce these rules because of the sovereignty clauses, then states do not want to comply. What do you want WTO to do? Right. Basically, its hands are tied. Correct. That's the rationale down here. Right. It hands or, or it, no, yeah. Okay. I wouldn't say its hands are tied, but um, it becomes it makes it more difficult for you to enforce anything because states are already not complying to start off with, and you have these domestic problems that they are, they are bringing on uh onto a global level. Right. Like you know the weaponizing of you know the trade lobby and so on. Right. So you know let you know think about it carefully before you know you just whack an organization with your criticism. Some, some, why I point this out is that sometimes when I read the answers, right, it's very, very clear from the outset, that means from the first line of the paper itself, right, you already can tell this student is just going to go on a one-sided tirade against the organization. There is no room for an alternative or counter-argument. Please do not write uh, answers that are so unbalanced like that. Right. Okay. All right. So please, you know, think about this. You know, whose responsibility is it really at the end of the day? Okay. Then you also have, like, you know, what we highlighted: the developed versus the developing countries, the self description or the attachment of such labels. Right. Uh, you know, on China, India, you know, Brazil, who are continuously asking for these uh, special and preferential treatment status. Uh, you know, despite them seeming to have outgrown this label of developing states, right? Okay. Uh, and also, you know, they tend to resist negotiating the new areas like what I highlighted to you earlier on. And therefore, you know, what you see is that, you know, the, the structural inequality has, has only been reinforced as opposed to broken down. Okay. All right. So basically what, you know, at the end of the day, after all of these failures and after all of these rounds of negotiation, it's laid bare, right, the intentions of states. And basically, you know, it has, instead of reducing the divide, it's actually furthered the divide, right? That's what you would say. Okay. Uh, and also, you know, um, this rationale, you know, about what is the role of international organizations? How have their interests been you know, fulfilled or served by international organizations, especially like, you know, if you look at 
particularly Trump's reign, right, in on the global, uh, sorry, Trump's reign. Uh, and if you look at how he, in particular, looked at the 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 role that the U.S. plays on a global platform, right? So the rationale const- constantly is that are we, uh, you know, as as a state. Uh, I mean, from Trump's perspective, right? Trump's USA's perspective, uh, you know, have they basically um, taken on more responsibility on behalf of the rest of the states, right? Uh, you know, you know, my interests are not being served, but I'm participating in an organization, right, that is actually helping to strengthen other states. So this logic of, you know, absolute gains and relative gains, right? Remember the logic of, you know, how some states view participation in international organizations in a more zero-sum manner, right? And, and when they view it in a zero-sum manner, they're not inclined to contribute to it. They're inclined to only extract gains for itself, right? Okay, so that is, you know, the logic. And, you know, this is fueled by populist backlash back home, right? With the anti-establishment forces, with the forces, you know, uh, domestically who are, you know, asking, what, you know, has my state done for me, right? Uh, you know, uh, withholding votes, you know, swing voters and so on like that, right? So, you know, the rationale is that, you know, unless, you know, these kinds of perceptions are addressed, unless they are changed, probably it has changed slowly, right, you know, since the shift from Trump to Biden, right? But it is still a bit too early to also, you know, say that, you know, we've seen a, a glorious shift either, right? So, you know, the damage done is the damage done. Like, say, for example, the damage done in Trump's reign with regards to the appellate body, right, is still has not been settled yet. You know, I was looking for updates for that, right? It still has not been settled yet, right? I've, I've got an update for you, uh, you know, later on, okay? And, you know, similar to, like, what we saw with the IMF and the World Bank, uh, you know, the the organizations, sorry, the, the activist organizations, like, uh, you know, Battle of Seattle, which is a conference, then you've got 50 years in, is enough, you know, constantly highlight that these organizations, in a very Marxist style, Right, they constantly highlight that these organizations, you know, or, or realist style. Either way, you can you want to uh, put it, you know, they highlight that these organizations basically function to serve the interests of the developed states or the bourgeois class. Right, you you know this argument, right? The Marxist, you know, logic, right? When you look at things in terms of, uh, you know, the socioeconomic classes, specifically the bourgeois versus the proletariat, right? And basically, you say that you know states. Organizations, right? They are vehicles simply to push, push what, push the bourgeois class interest, right? Or the developed states' interest, right? Okay, so that you know highlights to you that you know the problems have not gone away; they've not abated either. All right, uh, Battle of Seattle. You can take a look at this one. Uh, states, uh, developing states, were very offended. Uh, they didn't make any much headway, and they felt that you know the chief negotiator was very rude. Uh, you know, completely disregarded, you know, what the, the, the requirements of the developing states were. Some of the um, uh, developing states were not even invited to the negotiations. They were actually excluded from the negotiations. It was happening at a very fast pace, right, which was like, you know, it, like everything was in a blur for a lot of these developing states, right? So, you know, um, if you have negotiations that are happening at a very fast pace, right, what does that tell you? that the complex issues are not being negotiated or ironed out at all, correct? That's, you know, because you're, that means you're overlooking all of these complexities, right? Correct? And there is a lack of debate. So it's just like the louder voice of the developed states, you know, pushing for particular agendas, extracting concessions, right? Without, you know, actually, you know, taking into consideration what the needs of the developing states actually are, all right? A couple of videos for you. Uh, watch this one this one the world i mean it's it's kind of i mean it's it's fun to watch right and you know basically you know and look at the way they've you know world world economic terrorist organization you know they, so it suggests to you you know uh you know what is the take that they have right okay so take a look at that this is one of the newer ones right um the the future of the world trade organization all right and then a couple of other videos are linked for you earlier on take a look at those right some of the videos are actually quite long uh you know because it, it has got very long drawn discussions very detailed uh you know so uh forward a little bit just have it in the background maybe when you're eating lunch or something right and extract only the important points okay all right 
Okay, this one was the one uh, that I was referring to about, you know, um, the Battle of uh, Seattle, the 20th anniversary, right? So, you know, these are the accusations that were leveled against it, right? Take a look at that. Uh, basically, you know, the idea of uh, saying that, you know, you claim that the WTO was supposed to go towards, you know, protecting jobs in developing states and so on, but, you know, it has failed abysmally. These are the usual charges that Battle of Seattle and, you know, organization, activist organizations like 50 Years is Enough will highlight, uh, you know, that the inequalities have only become more pronounced, right, despite, you know, several years of existence, right? So take a look at um, uh, this. Also, you know, um, I think the timing is also something that you want to take a look at. When they uh, looked at the Battle of Seattle per se, right, the WTO had only been around for about five years because it was previously get. Right, and then it transformed into WTO, right? So, you know, some of the charges by Battle of Seattle also may be a bit unfounded because basically that would have been a criticism of, uh, you know, GET, which did not have the legal ability to do what it was supposed to do because it was simply a regime as well, right? So that is why I pointed this, you know, uh, point out, you know, about the Battle of Seattle. Uh, at, at that point, it you know, WTO was actually quite young, right? But the critics, you know, um, basically pointed out that it was actually being used, abused by private sector, used, abused by the bourgeois classes, right, to extract what they wanted. This one, the DSB, uh, what happened was uh, there was a breakdown of the dispute settlement body. Uh, you had uh, the, you, you had the, because the judges that are appointed to the appellate body, they have specific, you know, uh, tenures, right? And as the tenures started expiring, the U.S. started blocking appointments of the newer judges. So it came to a point, right, that you only had one member from China left uh, as of, I think, the end of last year, right? And when his tenure was also, you know, up for expiry already. And if you've got no more judges on the appellate body, what are you basically going to look at, right? So that was, you know, the problem down here. The U.S. problem was, you know, you know basically the usual complaint, right, that we don't have enough exposure, we don't have enough voice, you know, basically you're using us, you know, for everything else except, you know, being uh, allowed to have, you know, a, a strong voice in the organisation. So the US basically said that they had fewer judges than the others, right, and, you know, until, uh, you know, they changed, you know, the structure of the appellate body according to the US uh, liking, right, they're not going to approve of any more judges. So they're not going to approve any more judges then, the appellate body just came to a, you know, a standstill. So what happened was um, they tried to, uh, Canada and EU tried, I'm sorry, it's very small, it, but it's, it's this, this, this point now. Can you see where the, the cursor is, right? This is the point. Uh, China, sorry, uh, Canada and EU, they started to you know, work on a shadow appellate body that would you know, still continue to function. Right. And, uh, you know, they were trying to, uh, they had a meeting and a forum to try to see, you know, how they can, uh, you know, solve this and, and reinstate. So as of uh, October 2021, Biden's nominee to the WTO, Maria Pagan, right, she has made a promise to say that uh, they are working very quickly right, and attempting to reverse this uh, decision, right, they will, you know, uh, work quickly to restore the defunct appellate body, right, so, you know, that uh, is, is the problem, but as of now, right, it has not really, you know, come to any fruition just yet, right, so it is still, like, you know, in limbo, okay, so, you know, they've consistently been talking about, uh, you know, uh, reform, China has actually had a very large voice, I've got, I found a couple of articles, uh, which I will upload for you after uh, the lecture, right, relating to China's perspectives on the reform. They've been proposing, you know, several uh, reform proposals, right? So, you know, the rationale is that, you know, you want to move away from what the WTO has degenerated into, which is a series of bilateral or plurilateral regional FTA type of, you know, negotiations. And uh, the logic is that you want to consistently sorry, you want to consistently ensure that uh, it works towards reducing. Cannot, we cannot say that, you know, the WTO is going to be successful in ameliorating the gap between the developed and the developing. So we want to use softer keywords, right? So tackling, reducing, right, uh, the discrepancy between the global north and the global south, right? Okay, so, you know, um, until, you know, your US-China trade 
uh, you know, dispute has completely dissipated or at least reduced drastically, you're not going to see, you know, much progress, right? Uh, but the problem is that, you know, Sino-US, uh, you know, unhappiness tends to not just stem from trade, but stems from a whole lot of other issues as well, right? Uh, so that is another, you know, issue now, you know, China-US embroiled in another debate or it's sparked off this tension, right, uh, over Biden's comments on Taiwan, right? Uh, you know, is that like a new US policy to Taiwan or, you know, is Biden just, you know, looking at things in a slightly different perspective? You know, what does it actually spell, right? So until this tension sort of dissipate and, you know, uh, it reaches, you know, a more calm manner, right, then, you know, it will be difficult to, you know, uh, look at the it will be difficult to see improvements, right, uh, in, you know, what kind of uh, responses these two states have, seeing that they are the largest states with the largest voices in a lot of these organizations. Same thing applies to the WTO, right? So, you know, you know uh, the, the problem actually is, is that if you continue to allow a weak WTO, right, that can be basically swayed by the demands, right, of the developing and the developed states. Then, what are you going to see? It is going to undo everything that it has done in attempting, right, to ensure that your economically strong countries, right, are, you know, uh, not going to eat up the smaller, you know, states like what we discussed in the world jungle of trade. You understand the logic down here? All right, okay. All right. So take a look at this question. Right, uh, you know, the last few weeks I've been uploading the the addendums for you. Not sure whether you know. Uh, I mean. Take a, I mean, let's look. At, let's do it this way. Uh, sooner or later, you're going to have to start practicing, you know, your exam answers, right? So, you know, what you can do is, uh, you know, over the weekend or, or you know the next few days, right? Look at the questions. Try to sort out how you would approach answering the questions. I'm not saying that you have to write a practice essay for every single topic, uh, but get into the habit of at least breaking down the question. That's the most important thing. Right? At least, I, I know a lot of people will start revising closer to the prelims. Some people will start revising after the prelims because not everybody takes the prelims also. I recommend that you take the prelims, right? But I do know that, you know, sometimes, you know, just, that, just not enough time to finish revising. But what I would recommend is every time, you know, I upload one of these uh, questions, right? Uh, work towards breaking down the question. What's the question asking me for? At least get that part done. Right, and then compare it to you know the answer suggestion that is uploaded. Right, so you know that I, I don't think that would take you too much time. Right, at, at least you know at least you've done something. Right, that requires you to look at the notes and recall some of the concepts. Right, and practice breaking down the question because that is the first step. This course, right, the questions are complex. Uh, admittedly, I, I cannot I cannot not say it to you. I cannot sugarcoat it. Right, so the questions are complex. Right, uh, you know, if you go into the VLE and you look at the international forum and how the students, you know, talk about it, lost some students are doing it like for the third time round, fourth time round, and so on. I mean, I don't know where where they are, whether they are independent candidates or what, uh, but they are complex questions. So you have to get into the habit of breaking down the questions, not just for this course. You may, you know, you may take the same approach for other courses as well. Okay, all right. I will see you next week. We will do NATO. Okay, all right. Okay. Is it NATO? Yeah, NATO. We'll do NATO. Well, again, you know, NATO is one of those really good topics, you know, where you can basically almost pre-prep what, you know, what answer, you know, you want to write, uh, you know, because questions are very, very straightforward with NATO. Okay? All right. Okay, I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.